Hi guys, it's Crypto Crazy here, or CC for short. Um, look, I wanted to give the community a bit of an update in terms of where things are at for us. Um, also wanted to talk broadly about uh, macro conditions, what's happening, some things that people might want to do for their own personal uh, financial security. Um, just some tips that you might want to consider. Um, also wanted to give you a little bit of an update on what's happening with the Oracle service on Pulse Chain. So hopefully you'll enjoy this very short uh, and brief update, but it's really important that uh, you guys are aware of what's going on, particularly now that um, V3 is launched. So what's happening? V3 is out. Yay. We're all pretty happy about that. Um, I think a couple of things, though, from our perspective is that there's a number of functions that are not yet just available just yet, particularly within PulseX. Um, so some of our development has had to review uh, existing for all the functions that were working previously. We've had to sort of review and, and just make some modifications to some of those. Um, obviously, we'll wait to see as uh, PulseX evolves. Uh, our suspicion is that some of those functions will come online in the future. So we're getting a, a lot of work is being done and getting our archive node up. Uh, on the previous testnet, uh, look, the Pulse chain devs were quite kind enough to allow us to access their archive node at the time. Um, that option is not available now that V3 is out, so we're having to spin up our own archive node. Um, we're well on our way, so we've certainly been working on getting the, uh, the node to sync up with all the necessary data. It does take a, a fair while to do that. Um, in, it may take another couple of weeks before we've got a fully um, loaded archive node. Um, fundamentally, though, that doesn't stop our development. It just means that some of the functionality, particularly around things like uh, analytics or reporting of information, uh, that we rely on uh, GraphQL that effectively needs aggregate data coming from the archive node, we're kind of there's a dependency there. And so as a consequence of that, we're not in a position to actually provide or roll out the um, the DAP just yet, but we're, we're waiting for that archive node to come up and online so that uh, we can then redeploy all of the contracts and actually get you guys to start testing and, and using the system. Um, one thing we will do, though, and that's that's probably going to be announced, uh, I'm hoping, early next week or sometime next week, is that we're going to end up providing a little bit more detail around the points outcome from the delayed gratification perspective. So you guys would have seen uh, the sacrifice.io. It actually had a lot of the points allocations for the various wallets. And if you had a look at that, it would also um, respectfully show people, okay, did I delay? What were the delays? And in aggregate terms, um, what we're now allow allowing you guys to look at is effectively it's going to be a different site. Uh, the site is called neverselling.io. And what that's going to provide is a summary of, um, if you connect your wallet, it will show effectively what the total amount of um, tokens were sacrificed. But more importantly, if there was a points allocation, it will also display the appropriate month or the period of time after launch that you can access some of those tokens. So technically, everyone receives their tokens on day one. It's just those that have actually decided that, hey, you know what? Um, I prefer to delay for up to two years or for six months or 12 months or what, whatever the election was, um, this particular website will actually show you once you've connected your wallet um, when you should be expecting um, allocation of points uh, according to your delayed gratification. So that'll come out in the next week. Um, but as I said, in terms of the DAP itself, we're kind of re reliant on having the archive node uh, fully synced uh, our expectation is that that does take a little while. So we're probably at least a, t a couple of weeks away from that happening. Uh, once once that does happen, then we're more than happy to to relaunch the, the DAP and have you guys play around with it. A couple of things to let you know what we do in the interim. So whilst there's still a fair amount of development that we're working on, um, there's actually a lot of uh, deployment testing that we go through. So the QA team goes through a, a, a fairly regular redeployment process. So what does that mean is that deployment, considering that we're launching a, a, an immutable product, um, it's got to be right. So there's no room for error. And so the best way of avoiding error is to basically go through the process a number of times. So the team religiously goes through a deployment, a practice deployment on a regular basis, just to ensure that we've got our the process quite clear and well documented and the guys know exactly what they need to do.
um, as we're going through that deployment. But that's just part and parcel of what the, the team's working on and our QA is very solid. So from that point of view, we're really comfortable with that. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is that once we've got all of the contract changes completed, and there's st still a few changes required, um, most of those changes relate to uh, calling a price directly from the Oracle service that I'll speak a, speak a bit more about in a minute. But we need to nail that. Once we've got that, then we've already flagged with our auditor that, hey, we're pretty close and they'll be able to go through and start auditing the code. Um, to be perfectly honest, I mean, we've gone through a fairly rigorous testing process so we're not anticipating any major issues, but it is an important process to go through and it's it's done in an independent fashion so that there is a um, an independent review of the code uh, to give the community and ourselves, to be honest, a, a sense of assurance that, hey, we've done everything we can. And if there are any other modifications or tweaks that we have to make prior to deployment, we'll make those. But rest assured the team are practicing that process uh, and that's crucial for the final deployment. A um, couple of other things I, I did want to talk about, and I'll talk about the Oracle service in a minute, but just to digress a bit, there's a lot of discussion at the moment around broader macro conditions, and obviously crypto tends to, um, you know, unfortunately we're, we're impacted by that like just like any other market, um, but there's been a lot of chatter about inflation, the coming pending banking crisis, you know, that we're, we're leading into a massive recession, you know, that the world's going to end, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I think whilst it would be remiss of me not to agree that, hey, we're not in, the circumstances are not great, um, I don't necessarily, necessarily prescribe to some of the negative commentary around the markets at the moment. So, and look, I should point out, whilst I've, I've got some experience in this field, I'm not an expert, um, but my view is, and this is quite a clear view around uh, the US dollar and people suggesting that it might collapse, blah, blah. I'm not an exit in this field and I, it's, it's certainly not uh, intended to be financial advice, but it's more about an, an assurance of, hey, what can you do? What can you actually do to, to feel that you're getting the right information? Well, I think what people need to remember is um, if the US or any other country, and this is the important thing, every other country, if you have a significant amount of your sovereign debt, so in other words, what the country owes in the debts that it's taken out, if a significant proportion of that is in US dollars, then that's a telltale sign that you need to repay your debts in US dollars. So the first thing is that that would suggest that, look, it's very unlikely that the US is going to lose its reserve currency status, uh, certainly not in the short term. Um, sure, there, there is a chance that you know things could progress to the worse and there may be some concern around um, how long the US dollar can maintain its reserve currency status. But you've got to remember that most of the debt, I think it's something around 60% of global debt, sovereign debt, is actually denominated in US dollars. And I think the nearest rival in terms of debt, I think, is the euro, which is around the 17% or 20% mark. So I kind of feel that unless that shifts significantly, we're not going to see the dollar collapse anytime soon. Um, the challenge that we generally will have, and this will be felt globally, if there's any sort of problems within the banking sector, which kind of leads me to something else. And and guys, I'll, I'll talk about this stuff, but you know, it, it's a little bit removed to our this the sort of material that I normally cover around updates. Macro conditions, what people tend to get mistaken with the banking sector is there's a number of particular theories that realistically they've been disproven, um, but I still hear them being touted at the moment. Uh, one is that, you know, somehow banks are intermediaries, but so basically they move money from one particular person to another and they intermediate that or facilitate those transactions. Um, that's been disproven. That's not the way the banks work. Um, the other is, and, and I've heard this a number of times from a number of people, and that is that there's somehow fractionally reserved lending um, that's a nonsense. It, it's a fallacy. So I think it's a it's a narrative that's been running around for quite some time that somehow, if you place a deposit with the bank, that the bank can only end up end up lending a certain amount of that to somebody else. Whilst we'd like to think that that's the case, that's not the case, and it's been empir empirically proven that that is not how credit is created. The way credit is created is out of nothing, and that's the scary part. So banks effectively will take on uh, an asset. So for example. Um, they'll take on a property. So you turn up at the bank and say, look, I'd like a loan. Thank you very much. Uh, you borrow a certain amount of money. 
Uh, the banks are happy to lend that to you to a certain uh, level, right? So there's usually a loan to value ratio that they look at and they say, well, okay, look, anything over and above that, we have to start insuring. But generally it's 80% or below, you, you're likely to get uh, the, the, the borrowing approved. But on the basis that what the bank is really doing is you're providing access to that property and they actually have right over that property and then they provide you with the loan that you can then use to purchase the property. But fundamentally, they they have lien over your asset, and if there's any if there's ever a problem, they will just effectively um, liquidate that asset to recover any outstanding debt that you may have with them. So money supply, which by and large is ninety seven percent of money in circulation, is through debt. It's actually created as a consequence of that type of borrowing. And the unfortunate thing about that is that most of that type of borrowing, when it's for assets of that type or for investment or for speculation, that generally leads to inflation, right? So it creates asset bubbles and it generally leads to inflation. So hence property is one example of that. It doesn't help with GDP. It doesn't produce anything. It's just something that you're borrowing to acquire an asset that has no real productive value. On the flip side, if you are lending for productive purposes, that generally doesn't lead to increases in inflation. What it tends to do is it actually improves GDP. So that's a better method of lending. But here's the catch. We've gone through, and you know, I'll put my tinfoil hat on a little bit. We've gone through a period now where uh, the banking sector at large um, has been lending for non-productive assets for a long time. And, and effectively, that's creating the bubble that we're seeing at the moment, and it will also lead to a potential down, downturn. Um, the problem for that for most uh, countries is that if you continue to go down that path, there will be a banking collapse. Now, what does that really mean? Well, it basically means that, you know, the, the credit creation slows, um, and what we tend to see or what, you know, people tend to assume that just because the Fed increases interest rates that somehow is going to be a precursor to a slowing of the economy. It's not how it works. Generally, what tends to happen is increases in GDP or increases in productivity tends to lead to um, an increase in interest rates. So interest rates are effectively a lag indicator. So, you know, th there's a view that, okay, well, once the, the Fed pivots, somehow that will mean a return to buoyant times for the economy. Well, it couldn't be further from the truth. I think historically it's shown that when that happens, usually there's a downturn. And the reason being is interest rates are a lag indicator. They're not a leading indicator. What is What drives a lot of this is credit creation. So what do I mean by that? If the banks slow credit creation, generally that will lead to a downturn in the economy. If they increase credit creation, that usually leads to a more buoyant economy. The challenge that we have is how that credit is being deployed. So if you have credit that's being deployed to non-productive assets, that leads to inflation. And that's the challenge that the Fed is trying to deal with. But it has a very blunt instrument in interest rates. And we know that interest rates are a lag indicator. They're not a lead indicator. So... Anyway, why am I rambling on about this stuff? Because I actually think there's a lot of um, misunderstanding in terms of how credit is created. Banks make it out of nothing. And effectively, some of the problems that we're seeing with the banks of late has been largely due to the fact that some of the money that they take from us as depositors, and incidentally, this is a very a, probably a less known fact, is that when you deposit at a bank, you no longer have control of your money. So how different is that to crypto? Right? If, you, if, you, if you provide your coins or your tokens to a third party, you lose control. It's no different in the banking sector. As soon as you deposit money in a bank, the bank has a liability. Sure, it has to return that to you. But technically, they now, they now own the asset. You don't. And they can do as they will with that asset. So in many ways, I think, you know, you could talk to anyone on the street and they say, oh, that's my money. Well, actually, technically, it's not. It's the bank's money and they will do what they will with it. Now, tell me if that's no different to some of the failures that we've seen in crypto where exchanges have actually done the wrong thing or they've speculated the wrong way and all of a sudden you can't get access to your money. There's not a lot of difference when I look at it from a TradFi to what we're, we're seeing in some DeFi, particularly with exchanges, that you know if they go bust, effectively you've lost, you've lost all of your tokens.
and it's because you've handed over your keys. Well, in this case, every time you place a deposit at a bank, that becomes the bank's asset. You, you, they have a liability to you, but that's their asset and they can do as they will with it. Anyway, I'm digressing a little bit. So, so one of the challenges that we've seen, we've seen a number of banks. Um, uh, Silicon Valley Bank was one example. Uh, that's you know, there's there were problems with that. Now, fundamentally, that was they backed the wrong horse. They put uh, they put themselves into or locked themselves into long term bonds. Uh, the bonds uh, effectively the face value or the the actual value of those bonds declined as interest rates went up. So it would be like an example like uh, giving them a thousand dollars and and thinking shit. I now want. <laughs> I now want my money back. Well, I go to the bank and I say, look, I'd like my money back. Thank you very much. And they think, oh, we've locked it up for a period of time and we're, we now would need to offload that. And that $1,000 is no longer worth $1,000 if we have to liquidate it. It's only going to be worth $700. So we're going to be short $300 to pay you back. Now you can imagine if you have a lot of people doing that, that's when it, it becomes a massive problem. So a lot of the issues with Silicon Valley Bank was from a, a lack of risk management. I think their risk manager was gone for about nine months. So they really didn't have a very um, solid way of managing risk and particularly interest rate risk, right? They should have hedged against those sort of risks, but they didn't. They didn't have those plans in place. So that was a failure of uh, traditional finance. But in some respects, it parallels what we tend to see in crypto, right? So there's not a lot of difference between the two. Now, the only other thing that you might want to consider as an individual, because, you know, again, there's a lot of speculation around, well, why the hell did this happen in the first place? And some would speculate that fundamentally what the central powers are looking for is they want to effectively reduce the number of banks in the system. So they'd much rather have a smaller number, much more centralised, much more controllable, uh, than have too many small players out in the market. And the problem that I can see for, for communities and for particularly for countries at large is that as soon as you start declining the number of banks, a lot of the lending to small business happens at regional levels. It doesn't actually happen with the majors because the majors don't see, there's no money in it for them, basically. They look at it and think, well, there's too much of a headache. We're just going to make it extremely hard for a business particularly in a local community, you actually build something. Uh, it's much easier to take bricks and mortar, apply the mortgage, apply all the the, the typical lending uh, ratios that they provide. That's an easier, sustainable method for them, but it does nothing for GDP. So all of those smaller banks, however, tend to lend to, for those reasons. And I think some of those smaller banks, um, you know, if we see them disappear, I think it's not a good thing for a community at large. Um, because a lot of that lending that's required for real productive use is going to diminish. And unfortunately, I think that's that's our way forward is to actually have a much more decentralised banking system um, to enable and support uh, local communities to build. So what's the parallel to us? Well, we are, a, we are I feel Liquid Lines is a community bank. So it's the community that actually determines uh, the lending. Um, ultimately, it's the community lending to itself. Um, there's no middlemen. And it's effectively a really nice way of being able to um, extract some value from the system. But fundamentally, it's based, it's community based, right? And I think that's the um, that's the point of difference between that and a centralized model. Um, but also, I personally don't mind the regional banks because they're they're generally lending for community reasons, and it's a much more productive way of lending. Again, if you're concerned, if you if you de have deposits in a bank in a bank somewhere, and let's face it, most of us do, there are some ways that you can actually review the health of a bank, right? So, uh, all banks largely are regulated, and, and certainly here in Australia, they're quite regulated. Um, but most institutions that I'm aware of actually follow um, the global regulatory framework, and it's one particular one that the most current one is called Basel Three. Now, Basel III has a number of conditions that are placed on uh, deposit-taking institutions, right? So anyone that takes deposits, there has to be uh, a way of managing that. So um, in Australia, it's ADIs that are usually managed in that way. But fundamentally, they set the rules and they set the guidelines, right? So one of the things that, that was introduced in Basel III recently, and this is relevant and you might want to consider looking at this for your own bank, there's a number of liquidity measures, right? So liquidity is probably the biggest fear of even in crypto. Low liquidity creates a lot of volatility. You can imagine it's the same sort of thing in traditional finance. The biggest risk that the banking sector, ha sector has 
is becoming liquid. And then you have a bank run and you can't meet the requirements of the community. If you want to check on your bank, there is a, a ratio you can look at. It's called the um, liquidity coverage ratio. And basically what that looks at, it says something along the lines of, hey, bank, what are all the assets that you have that are highly liquid that you can convert to, to cash really quickly? Let's aggregate those. But now let's also look at your net outflows over a period of 30 days under significant stress. So there are a whole range of stress conditions that are placed. What would be your outflows during that period? Now compare that with how quickly you could liquidate assets to actually meet those requirements. And they develop that into a ratio. Now, the good thing about that is it's a, it's a standard measure that's applied across all banks. Um, regulators tend to monitor it fairly closely. I think the reporting regime suggests that it's at least a monthly report. If you have concerns about a small bank or a regional bank that you're banking with, it's probably worth your while to have a look at that liquidity coverage ratio. So it's called the LCR. And generally, most banks will publish a document. So having said that, I think some of the moves that the Fed has taken um, to effectively backstop some of the, the runs is, is a good thing. We don't, we, the, the whole traditional finance doesn't need a run. And we certainly don't want to be the, um, you know, unfortunately suffer the consequences of a massive bank fallout. I think in the future, we might see something like that. But personally, I, I would hate to see that happen in the short term. Um, I think it's one of those things that, you know, because of the excessive credit creation by the banks and particularly for non-productive assets, we've seen a lot more of that. So it's unfortunate, but that's the circumstances we find ourselves in now. And the other thing that I tend to, to hear a lot of is, oh my goodness, the Fed's balance sheet's ballooning again, they're creating money and the money printer's going brr. That's not entirely true. So effectively what's happened recently is that the Fed has said to the banks, and remember that the Fed and the commercial banks are a closed system. So what do I mean by that? Just because the, the Fed creates something to help support the other banks doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to become come out into the com consumers and consumers start to spend and inflation go up. If it's contained within the banking sector itself, it doesn't have any impact on inflation at all. What it's really doing is it's saying to the banks, listen, you've got some assets that on, 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 the, on appearances, they've actually declined. So if you had to liquidate them, they're not worth what they used to be worth. Don't worry, we're the Fed, we'll cover you. So whatever the face value is of those assets, we'll cover you. So we're effectively cleaning up your balance sheet. We're cleaning up your balance sheet to enable you to continue to do what you need to do, but we'll take that on. Now, the reality is the Fed can, can do that for, for an extended period of time, and that will resolve a lot of the issues that we're hearing about at the moment. But the reality is there's still a lot of um, angst out there and, and probably some banks that haven't managed their interest rate risk very well. And as a consequence, if the Fed continues to raise interest rates, if they're not borrowing to cover for that and, and or if they're not able to at least ensure that they're not going to lose from having to liquidate some of those assets, then I think we may see some further runs. But at this point in time, I, I, I don't imagine, imagine that's going to happen. Um, look, guys, I know I've been rambling a fair bit. Um, there is one th other thing that I, I did want to talk about, and that's the Oracle service. Um, so Nick, Fed and I had a, a quick chat recently. Hopefully that video is going to come out soon uh, where we talk a little bit more detail around the Oracle service and how that's going. Uh, fundamentally, we will be launching a native version of Tello on PulseChain. Uh, the beauty of that is that we didn't really, we sort of had a really good conversation with the guys over at Tello and said, listen, we don't want to be bridging in tokens. That's, it seems like a Band-Aid approach. Let's create an Oracle service that's native to PulseChain. Now, obviously, we're recipients of that because we'll be using the Oracle service for price feeds. But I, I dare say that there's a number of other DeFi projects running on PulseChain that will benefit from that as well. So we've started conversations with some of those teams. Um, and I'd urge any team out there, like we're, we're really happy to support the community that's building because um, we know how hard it bloody is, um, especially when you're not getting much support. So it's really helpful if people do want to engage with us, either on using the Oracle service or being a participant on that or for any particular technical issue. And I think the other thing that people need to be aware of is um, bloody developments are 
there's a lot of services that that didn't exist on version two, and we know that there's some functionality that do doesn't exist now on v3. But there's a lot of other things that we've had to build. So, for example, if you guys like the sound of Gnosis, well, we have Gnosis up and running. We need it for a multi-sig for some of our wallets. But the challenge for us in that space is that whilst we have it running, we're not able to test all the functionality that Gnosis would provide. So we're working with some of the community members to help us with that, to say, listen, if you guys want to use Gnosis, we can't guarantee that it's going to be successful. We, we don't want to distract our team from testing the full functionality of Gnosis, but there are some members of the community that's helping us with testing. And again, I'm sure that there's a number of other projects that would probably benefit from using Gnosis. And I think collectively, if we can come together and, you, and you know, happy to sort of share what we've got and have conversations around, guys, let's collectively test this stuff because it's all helpful for us. Let's go through a process and, you know, provide feedback, et cetera. So more than happy to engage with any other teams that are doing that. I think fundamentally, if you're not familiar with Gnosis, I urge that you take a look at it. I think it's a fantastic tool. Uh, it will become available. Hopefully, um, you know, we can, we can put a front end on this in the future. At the moment, whilst we've got it functioning for what we want, um, again, because of the significant focus on what we're developing, uh, we're not in a position to share that with the community until it's had more thorough testing. And I think if other members of the community are willing to help and do some of that testing, we're really happy to share it and, and allow people to do what they want to do with it. Um, personally, I think it's it's a really nice tool to have. But that's just one example of the sort of things that we've had to do and build. Um, the other is, you know, there's just getting information and, and aggregating data, you need something called a subgraph. So effectively, you need to create that. So we've actually sp spun up another service uh, called GraphQL that's enabling us to do some of that. But again, all of that also relies on having an archive node. Now, again, as I mentioned earlier in, in this discussion, that the archive node just takes a while to build up. So we, and then, of course, we have to do all the relevant testing. So where are we at? I'm not going to say two more weeks. I'm just going to say that we continue to build and we'll do what we can. But I would urge any 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 other teams out there that, hey, if, if anything that I've said is of interest to you, reach out. We're very open to have conversations around this stuff and actually engage with other teams to, to help sort of test some of these tools that I think that will, will be very valuable for the community. Um, outside of that, guys, I think I've exhausted my time. I've probably rambled on a bit too much. Um, we're pretty excited the way things are developing. Um, I know now that with V3, look, the reality is that, you know, people expect this to be perfect day one. It never is. It's really bloody hard work, software development. And it's, there's no doubt that there's some other features that will come online. Um, obviously, we've had to, whilst we've got our contracts deployed on V3, they're in a private test net for the time being. And the reason for that is we're not going to make anything available that hasn't gone through a significant QA process. And so we're still going through that testing but more importantly, some of the functionality, like all the analytics stuff that we want to build into the DAP, we can't actually use just yet because we don't have the archive node up and running. So that's going to take a couple of weeks. But as I mentioned earlier, look out for uh, the delayed gratification site. That'll that'll be announced. Um, I really do hope that we can get something out to you guys next week so you can have a look at that. Uh, and in the meantime, I'd urge you to, if you haven't started playing around with Pulse, or PulseX or the bridge, I'd suggest you start playing around and at least, at least provide feedback. I mean, you know, the devs, it's hard work. It is bloody hard work. And it's also helpful when feedback comes in that's delivered in a constructive way. Um, I think, unfortunately, people tend to jump to conclusions very quickly. And I see a lot of tweets and I think, oh, my goodness, you know, it's, it's hard enough developing this stuff to have to endure some of the negativity. So, I think by and large, though, most people are quite positive and pretty happy the way things are. Um, but I do believe there's still a little bit more testing and QA to go on Pulse Chain and possibly even Pulse X. Uh, and we'll do our bit. We'll do what we need to do. Uh, and we'll keep you guys informed as to our progress. Um, again, thanks for listening to my ramble. Um, it's I don't know whether to call myself crypto crazy or CC. I think I'll go with Adam. Adam Stokes likes to call me CC. So I'm just going to sign off as CC from Liquid Loans. And again, thank you for your time.